you positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, where we are firmly convinced that creating success and happiness is rooted in understanding the ultimate nature of reality and the fact that as human beings, we are all immensely powerful fractals of the one and only source consciousness, which creates and animates all things. Now, of course, understanding this powerful truth is one thing. Applying this incredibly empowering wisdom to everyday life? Well, that's another. Which is exactly why we provide you with a fresh serving of soul food for thought five days a week to help constantly remind you of what matters most. You are it. And I'm your host, Brandon Beecham. I'm the reflection and extension of you who will be here each Wednesday interviewing a different consciousness change maker. And on the other four weekdays, leading the way to ensure that your perspective is consistently expanded, your vibration is constantly elevated, and your heart is overflowing and full. Also, before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to take about a minute and a half to tell you about a few sponsors that not only help to make it possible to produce this show five days a week, but that I'm also genuinely passionate about promoting. The first longtime stellar supporter of this show that I want to mention is Gaia. If you're not familiar, Gaia is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content online with over 8,000 video titles. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. The second sponsor I'm sincerely passionate about promoting is Purium. It's no mystery that bringing your mind, body, and spirit into balance is necessary if a person truly intends to manifest the greatest and grandest version of themselves. So if you've been looking for a way to easily get organic superfoods into your system every day with a simple plan that can help you reestablish a healthier foundation and relationship with food, like I was doing before I found Purium, I highly recommend going to positivehead.com forward slash transformation and checking out the videos and interviews there where I dive deeply into discussions explaining why I take these products every day. And should you ultimately end up on ishoppurium.com to purchase any of their 50 plus amazing superfood products, be sure to use the code positivehead, all one word, for a 25% discount. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Pow Wow episode, I'm very excited to have David Verdesi here with me on the show. David has traveled the world extensively over the last 30 plus years, studying cultures and traditions up close and personally with his primary focus on understanding techniques that lead to superhuman abilities some of which that could even potentially lead to enlightenment. So as you can imagine, very excited for this powwow. Hello, David. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hi, Brandon. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, such a pleasure. So I'm going to dive right in uh, at the same place. uh, I always have the same predictable opening question and closing question. And my opening question is this. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? What do you say? Love. Ah, and we got nine <laughs> floors to go, and she's just staring at you. I got it. <laughs> you know, my favorite, quote, my favorite quote, David, my favorite quote, <laughs> my favorite quote is love is the answer. Now, what was the question? So I'm with you on that. And, and obviously, you and I are aligned. And, and here's the funny thing. Not only did we get introduced through one of my very best friends, a brother from another mother, Shane Garrett, um, who told me, Brandon, you got to talk to this guy. But the funny thing is, is when he messaged me this months and months ago, I had just put together, David, and you don't even know this. I had just put together a trailer. This show is sponsored by Gaia, and I was meeting with them to talk about a potential docu series that uh, okay. I, I have entitled Optimistic, spelled M Y S T I C, Optimistic, right? Mm-hmm. And the idea of it, 
is for me to go around the world and highlight people doing magical things and also documenting synchronicities that unfold around me because a lot of synchronicity unfolds around me. So um, it, the f- awesome thing was when when Shane sent me and told me about you and what you're working on and the the, doc- the series you're working on, that, but you're on the other end of that. Like mine is like, hey, I want to go out and learn this stuff. And you're like already doing, coming from the angle of, hey, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I was like, oh my my gosh, I got to have this guy on, you know, he's the pro I'm the like seeker who wants to see more. And so, yeah, this is going to be good. Wonderful. Well, um, uh, it was interesting also the way that, uh, that we met uh, with Shane, uh, he was uh, in Bali, Indonesia, uh, and it was mm-hmm. a very interesting gathering of people there. And we actually only had like five minutes to talk, maybe 10 minutes top. And uh-huh. they say, well, absolutely, I got to connect you with Brandon. And I say, right. okay, sure, I'm, I'm waiting. And then, you know, the months passes and I kind of, you know, forgot about it. And then out of the bloom, he writes me again. He say, David, uh, you know, I've been busy, whatever. And I say, now is the time. That's it. I'll, I'll connect with Brandon. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it really has to happen. So it's good. <laughs> oh, so good. You know, and when Shane contacted me about you, he had no idea because he's in Bali. You know, I'm here in LA area. And we, we really, you know, we used to see each other all the time when he lived nearby. And now it's like, you know, a couple times a year we're, we're, we're talking until he's come home from Bali f- for the summer or whatever. But I hadn't heard from him in months and months and he sends me you know all, talking about this and i'm like hold on this is sh- are you kidding there's someone who's already done this of course there is excellent i gotta like i gotta get the download so why don't we do this um let's start i i also like to start whenever i have a guest on to hear a little bit about their story and what led them i mean obviously your story is a very unique and incredible one so i'd love to maybe you know back up and tell us a little bit how did you end up doing what it is that you've been doing the last 30 years well, I always like to say that it's a perfect uh, mix of uh, a very deep suffering. Uh, the carrot in front, so that, that pull, that drive, of course, to emerge from that suffering toward a, a sort of a, a condition that is beyond it all, let's say a condition of awe, of joy, of, of, of any way of peace or transcendence, mixed with some very precocious mystical experiences, which mm. convinced me that, that there was something beyond it all. So that mm. sort of is the, is the answer that I could tell without going into the details. But, uh, right, right. Uh, but um, uh, I think that is a pretty much of a universal uh, archetype. We, we, we think of the story of the Buddha, right? I mean, he was a prince, uh, but then even in this life of luxury and everything, he, he realized that there exists some deep unfulfillment. You know, we see this a lot with people even living, you know, sort of dream lives, you know, but then they are they're deeply dissatisfied within. So there is something deep inside that is not fulfilled. And so right. that, that tension, that unfulfillment, that let's call it a kind of suffering to, to an extent, right? Which can be right. mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever is it, right? It pushes you, pushes you to to do something. And so if, if you answer to the call, and that suffering pushes you to move, and that movement is evolution, then logically you need something in front, because our mind needs a pleasurable pole to move toward to. And when we move toward that which we perceive as our sort of goal, we start to give meaning to ourselves and to our life. So we start to experience meaning. When we start to experience meaning, we get closer to what we generally call a sense of fulfillment or happiness, right? And then if in these we manage to enter in that state of flow that is that one-pointedness where we become one with what we do and we can become completely absorbed in that and we start to have experiences that confirm the the possibility of the human mind, of the human nature to go beyond the limits that are generally imposed by our sort of society, birth, minds, belief system, health, or whatever is it, right? Then, Then we become more and more convinced that we are on the right path. And that's it. And, and then it's just a matter of keep going. And that's what I did. Wow. So, and, and boy, you, you didn't mess around either. I mean, 30 plus years traveling all around the world and, you know, you've studied 
you know, all the traditions or not all of them, but a lot of them. Right. Uh, I mean, when I was kind of researching on you, you know, doing my research, you've been recognized in, in traditions from shamanism, Sufis, Hindus, you know, Taoist, Christians, Buddhist saints, you know, all these different, um, you know, six different yoga traditions. Um, and to me, that is absolutely fascinating. So I'd love to maybe get the download from you on sort of, mm-hmm. you know, what, what all of those have, what, what is, what have you distilled from that? What is, what's come of, of, of studying all those things for you? Um, well, you know, the, the journey, uh, my journey was uh, to a certain extent very chaotic in the sense that um, I, in the beginning, I didn't really know what I was looking for other than uh, try to to make sense of those very early experiences I, I can tell you what they were I mean I was raised in a in a Catholic school in a priest school basically and so every mm-hmm. morning before going going to class we would go to church and you know and I was like six years old right and you know and and going into the church I mean you know five days out of seven uh, uh, I would have some kind of mystical experience. I was seeing the light. I was feeling God. I was, you know, crying, and not, I, I could not explain it, right? And and uh, and so I I grew up with this unexplainable mystical experience that you know I was asking to my friend and and we sort of not, nobody really had it, right? So uh, that's really how the journey started. I wanted to make sense of something that I was experiencing. Uh, not only that, other thing that came into into my youth, like this strong sensation of like this electric-like current, but a really strong current kind of mm. running through my body, right? And so that's right. really how the journey started. W- looking for answer to some things that, that I was experiencing that I needed to understand and that I had a great urge to understand. And the other main thing for me was uh, death. I was terrified. It's a strange thing for a child, but I was terrified at the idea of becoming old, so a bit of a Peter Pan syndrome, although I was so young, yeah. and at the, at the idea <laughs> of death. And so I, I was like, I need to find a solution. I mean, there must be a way out of this conundrum, right? And so right. the journey really started on these premises. And... Uh, so I was like really going to each and every one asking them the question that I had at heart and not necessarily every one of them had the answers. And, uh, and so I started to say, okay, I need to start to create uh, a methodology in what I do and what I research. And so instead of taking the classical approach of, uh, you know, studying a thousand different techniques, a thousand different tradition, thousand different belief system, I started to say, okay, let me look at another another perspective. Now, what are the common results of them all? Mm. And so this one dramatically shifted. I mean, you know, I was not aware of anyone else before me that, that took this approach. You know, all the other seekers that I met along the way, people that gave me feedback and suggestion, they were like, oh, you got to study these techniques and this tradition. And I was like, okay, this is great, but I want to have a larger picture. So tell me what are the results. And then I started to compare results from African shaman, Mesoamerican shaman, Siberian shamans, you know, Taoist, Buddhist, the yogis, uh, you name it, right? And right. now, when when you when you look at these from the point of view of the results, what happens is that the <laughs> the list become much smaller. So you don't yeah. suddenly you don't have a, a thousand different techniques and a thousand different uh, tradition and belief system, but you actually have a fairly small number of common results that every single human being that apply him or herself to do some kind of transpersonal, let's call it spiritual practice, doesn't matter in which tradition, they all seem to get to this fairly small number of common results. And that's it. That's, that's when I nailed it. I said, oh, I'm on the right direction now. And so right. I focus, I zoomed in on what are really the common results of all this tradition. And then I say, doesn't matter which practice tradition, as long as you know, I can see that it gets to one of those common results, then I know that I'm mm. on the right path. Okay. Right, right. Many paths to the same destination sort of thing, right? Really, really, really so. Interesting, interesting. So 
One of the other things, um, you know, that I know you discovered on your on your path or that, that it, I, well, maybe you just even discovered it before your path is um, you had not only the experience of, of witnessing gifts uh, and even like superhuman type of gifts, uh, but had certain gifts open up in yourself um, like synesthesia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, I'd um, love to hear about like- that. <laughs> like as you as you go on the journey, I for sure had the had the bit of a peculiar attitude to to sort of stumble upon or encounter or even sometimes receive a kind of visionary sort of messages, if you if you so want to call it, uh, um, from from rather uh, um, extraordinary people. And, and sort of it became a bit of a trademark. I got so used to it that you know, I came to think that, okay, well, you know, that's sort of norm. I mean, I'm not going to waste time with anything less than someone that can levitate or pass through a wall or, you know, materialize right. things or, or generate light, visible light, you know, um, from his body or stuff like that. And... Um, and so, yeah, definitely. And that's the part that was very difficult because when I started to tell some of the stories, logically, most people would say, you know, you are dreaming, you are hallucinating, you are crazy. And yep. as a young as a young man, I sort of logically, it was a bit of a matter of, of pride and, and, and to say, well, no, I, I'm not crazy, I'm not hallucinating. So I started to take some people, and that's also how I started to make my living uh, for you know, quite a lot of money to say, okay, you don't believe it. I'm going to show you this thing. And, and so I started to bring sort of these VIP groups to witness the, 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 let's call it the superhuman, right? Right. And, and then along the journey, I figured out that that was not enough because it's like, you see the miracle one time, it's wow. You see two times, it's great. You see three times is okay. By the time that you see the same thing a few, few times, it becomes normal. Nothing right. has really changed in you. And so I say, okay, the, the, there must be the something else. And so I started to, to understand, uh, starting from what are the common results, meaning the common mental states, the common emotional states, the common uh, phenomenologies, the common experiences. Uh, and I started to deconstruct or reverse engineer many of those tradition and practices to realize that a lot of them, let's say that they were built uh, in retrospective. Okay, I give an example. For example, the Buddha never did Vipassana. Now everybody does Vipassana. The Buddha never did Vipassana to become enlightened. Vipassana is what he taught to his students when he had to explain how to get there. So mm. it's really the whole idea of, of most of these practices and techniques uh, is that it's created in retrospective. So someone has an experience, he has it, he can do it, right? And then someone else come along and say, show me, teach me. And then the, the guy who originally had experience suddenly is in front of okay, how do I explain this? How do I break it down so that the guy can get it, right? And so I started to realize that all of these practices and techniques from all this tradition, that's really what it is. It's just one guy that somehow can do it, maybe was born with it, maybe it happened to him spontaneously, you know, I have no idea, maybe he hit his head on a rock and then he started started to have this this, uh, uh, spiritual wisdom or spiritual power or or whatever whatever you see that he has or or she has, right? Right. And, and, and then he just had to kind of reverse engineer it. So I say, okay, if they did it, I want to do the same. So I started to use successful models from very successful, let's say, teachers, such as, for example, the Buddha. I just kind of keep going back to him. But uh-huh. also other, tra- other traditions. And then say, let me see if I understand how do you get to this kind of manifestation of these abilities, Right. And, uh, well, I mean, if you apply yourself to it, eventually I figure out that it can be achieved. And so I started to play a little bit, and I dedicate quite several years to it of intense retreat in caves, in mountains, in jungles, uh, in monasteries. And eventually I started to be able to do some of these things, right? To generate this energy, make some, you know, small manifestation. Uh, I, I was fixated with uh, setting things on fire. I, you know, the spirogenesis and uh, a few of my teachers, you know, they could, you know, look at something and just, you know, light it up. And I say, I have to do wow. this, you know, 
And after many years of our training, uh, eventually I got to, uh, you know, I never really managed to make anything grand, but toilet paper, I made it smolder. It didn't really, you know, light ignite, but it kind of, you know, wow. it got, you know, black kind of smolder. You know, I felt- Wow, that's, that's incredible though. That's incredible. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, I've made toilet paper black too, but it's a totally different technique. <laughs> Not nearly as intriguing, I promise you. <laughs> anyway, th those are the small things. They're really not the very important things. So coming back to your question of synesthesia, for example, um, well, synesthesia, I came to realize that it's, it's an innate condition that actually we all have. For example, if I tell you, um, think of red, how do you feel? Tell me the mm. texture of red. You're going to mm. keep me, well, red is warm. Uh, mm -hmm. Red is... Uh, you know, spicy, red is, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, soft, okay? Mm. That's it. Mm -hmm. You're having a synesthetic experience because ah. you're experiencing a taste, spicy. You are experiencing mm. a texture, softness. You are experiencing temperature. You are experiencing color. So, in fact, uh, all, we are all synesthetics. The thing is that we never really develop our ability to convert one sensorial stimulus into another. When we listen mm. music, uh, suddenly we have visions. We listen to a great piece of music and we can see certain scenarios, right? And we have certain emotions and we feel certain, you know, we can set the music at a certain temperature. So we all have this ability, just that when you methodically apply yourself to it, to learn, to translate any sensorial input into all of the senses, here is how you become synesthetics, right? Mm. And then some people, some people, of course, are, you know, uh, you know, more up to it, some people less, but everyone, especially, if, you know, if you take young children and you start to teach them early, everyone can become a synesthetic, you know. So a lot, of, a lot of these things, now aside, you know, setting things on fire, but a lot of, of these spiritual gifts to a certain extent, you know, I nowadays demystify them a lot, not because they are not real, they are very real. It's just that they need to put into the context of what actually is uh, the, the truly natural human capability of our mind, if properly trained. Right, right. You know, it makes me think of uh, Nassim Haramein, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work or not. Yes, 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 yes. Sort of absolutely, a cutting absolutely. edge physicist. I've seen a quote from him, and in paraphrasing, he says, All science is, you know, all spiritual, you know, wonders are m merely scientific, you know, things we don't understand yet. To, yes. and, and paraphrasing. And so, yeah, that's what that comes up for me when you say that. Yeah, very much so. All right. Well, now seems like a good moment to take a quick minute to tell those of you who aren't familiar a bit about our sponsor, Gaia. I've been a big fan of Gaia for many years now, which is why they're the only content provider I've ever reached out to in regards to potentially supporting this podcast. So needless to say, I'm very excited they're now supporting the show. Gaia truly is my personal go-to source for streaming consciousness content on the web. They have an incredible 7,000 plus exclusive videos covering 5,000 years of wisdom. Just to give you an example, on the show Missing Links, the incredible researcher Greg Braden explores all the biggest questions concerning who we are, where we come from, where we're going, by connecting the missing links between science and spirituality to complete our understanding of humanity's history and to better understand the interconnectedness of all things. Awesome, right? And that's just one example. As you guys constantly hear me say, it's a daily conscious effort to maintain an elevated vibration. And if you're looking to go deep down the rabbit hole to do so, then Gaia is the best place I know of to do it, period. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. So I would love to hear, I mean, smoldering toilet paper, pretty amazing. Like, I would love to hear some of the stories of things that you've witnessed and been privy to. I mean, 30 plus years exploring this sort of stuff. I, I got to imagine you have more good stories than just about anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a few. Again, I'm not very comfortable with sharing uh, a lot of these stories because it, it became a bit of a circus. 
And mm. a lot of these stories, logically, they need to be lived in the context <laughs> of the experience. Well, can I say this though? Before you think, uh, you know, think on that. This this audience is pretty specific in that there is a lot of like people. I have guests on who are channeling. I have people, you know, I mean, a lot of multi dimensional experience. So there's this isn't sort of like Fox News, you know. <laughs> there's right. a okay. lot that's of people good. with very open minds listening to this podcast. All right, that's good. That's very good. Well. Um, okay, let me start with something that uh, what I consider the, an amazing experience or an amazing uh, city, they're called, you know, sort of spiritual powers, changed mm-hmm. a lot as I grew up. Mm. Logically, when I was younger, I was attracted to more, uh, um, let's say, <sighs> evidence of physical manifestations, you know, and yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and so that, I thought that those were the coolest things. I, um, that so, kind of excites me too, the idea of something materializing. I get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that seems yeah, pretty yeah, darn yeah. cool. And, and so, you know, all these very physical abilities like, you know, uh, levitation. I, I did levitate three times uh, and I've seen quite a few people levitating for real. Um, without, uh, logic- without... Uh, Without a uh, one of those contraptions that make it appear like you're levitating? No, 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 no. The, the, the real thing, the real thing. And, and wow. the amazing thing that the, the first time that it happened, I didn't even, even realize it. We were with this you know, one very powerful teacher. Um, and uh, we were sitting there and he was sort of doing his, whatever it is that he was doing, uh, chanting incantation and so on and so on. And then he kind of come around and touched the top of our head and... Uh, you know, and close your eyes and suddenly you started to feel very light. But, you know, there was no any great other, other than just a sense of lightness, you know, which I experienced actually several other times before. So it was not even so much stronger. It was just this nice sense of lightness, right? And then, uh, so I was closed eyes, then meditating, and uh, my friend next to me at a certain point said, hey, David, David, I say what? I say, look at me. I look at him and he was like, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not familiar in inches, maybe like, uh, what would be in centimeters? Uh, uh, let's say five, six centimeters off the ground. And I was wow. like, wow. And, you know, and then I, you know, I, I came back to myself. So, so I brought back the awareness to, to on myself. And I also was about, you know, the same, uh, a few inches off the ground. Um, wow! Again, there was there was nothing really uh, transcendental about it. It, it, it sort of, it, it happened. And then when yeah. the master finished to do his things, so, you know, we, we kind of softly uh, landed back. Um, uh, you know, of course, it was interesting. And so I say, okay, I, I got I to gotta be able to do this myself. Right. And so eventually I went to find one master, actually it was a Taoist master, this one, um, who became pretty popular in the West, uh, Wang Li Ping. They wrote a book about him uh, opening the Dragon Gates. If mm. If, if any of if any of you is interested, you can read his biography. Uh, it's translated by Thomas Cleary. And mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like a fairy tale book when you read it, but you know, um, I, you know, I, I went to dig out the man uh, in China. This is, uh, we speak back in the nearly 16 years ago, uh, something uh-huh. like this roughly. And he was definitely not a public person and very hard to find. Anyway, so... I managed to find the guy and I lived with him for two years and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And eventually, you know, I did everything that had to be done. And, and one time I did levitate by myself. So it's, it's possible. Um, wow. I can tell you that uh, I only managed to do it one more time after that because it requires, you know, at least at my very kind of uh, humble level of practice, a lot of preparation, a lot of concentration, and blah 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 blah. It's not something that hey, just do it, right? Right. Um, but so it's that it's possible, right? And and this energy, which was another thing that was haunting me from when I was small, because everybody speak about energy, energy, energy. Do you feel the energy? And you know, I was feeling this kind of co- strong current, literally like a strong electric current inside me, but I could not bring it out. And and when everybody else was telling about feeling the energy between your hands, you feel energy of your aura, I instead could not feel anything, right? And when people were telling me, do you feel my energy? I was like, uh, no, not really. So I was also there, very frustrated and motivated to to find something real, to, mo- to kind of 
confirm my own experience. And then eventually I started to meet these people. And uh, one very famous one of my teacher is John Chang, the Magus of Java. They also wrote a book on him. They made a documentary on him, Ring of Fire. And, you know, and they have this current, this energy that feels like a strong electric current. Like, and, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and so I practice, I practice, I practice, I practice. And, and eventually also there, oh, I managed to you know, do a little bit of it. So a lot of those things is like, I never became like a great master. I train very hard because I'm not particularly talented, but I train very hard. I figure out, I understood the system, so the mechanics of it, I understood what to do and how to do it. And so with a lot of training, I managed to do some of these things. Like, and, and, you know, and you know what is interesting in the moment that I managed to do it, I lost interest in it. Interesting. It was like, okay, <laughs> done. You know, and, and I can tell you many of these things, materialization. So I went to see some of the sayings that materialize things, you know, many, many years ago, this famous guy in India, Sai Baba, right? Mm, yeah. And, uh, you know, there are voices. Was he real? Was he not real? I don't go into that debate. I can tell you that I had an experience, you know, when I was there with him and I, I arrived there as a complete skeptic, right? But it was definitely uh-huh. something very, very real happening. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then I say, okay, you know, I want to understand this thing of materializing objects and not only with him. So you were with Sai lives. Baba at this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, was with okay, cool. I, I was with all of them. You know, it's hard to find someone that I wasn't with. In- <laughs> wow, wow, cool. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, I practice, 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 and a couple of times, two or three times, oops, I managed to materialize something, right? Okay, done. And what? What, then, what did you materialize? Uh, some objects, some um, some ritual objects that are used in tantric Buddhism. They're like metal objects. And so really? Not, not, yeah, yeah. So they, wow, uh, you, you, that's uh, you fascinating. You see exactly where they are. And, you know, anyway, all of this stuff. Then, then it was the phase of shamanism. You know, and, uh, you know, of course, I read the book of uh, Castaneda and I sat on the foot to meet the man. Those, oh, were the cool. na- th- those were the early 90s and I managed to meet Carlos Castaneda. I managed to stay with him and then got wow. introduced to some of his teacher. And I wanted to, to be able to do some of the things that they describe, you know, sort of these magical steps, uh, this kind of moving your assembling point and be able to sort of do certain things, right? And I do, 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 and I have... Some success also in that, right? So for mm-hmm. most of the thing that I tried, I, I didn't write Excel, but I managed to say, okay, it's real, it's possible, it can be done. Alchemy, I dubbed in alchemy, the real alchemy. I found this alchemist, um, I don't know, they said that they were a thousand years old, 600 years old, and something like this, it's hard to tell, but... Oh, uh, wow. They def- the, they the, definitely person, sh- the alchemist claimed to be a thousand years old? Well, not himself, but the people around him, you know, sort of. Okay. You know, the guy, the guy wasn't really talking. Um, oh and, wow! But you know, they sh- they show me pictures in the village from the thirties, you know, all black and white pictures in the fifties, in the sixties. So true time, and the guy, and he looks the same. Speaking, he looks pretty much unchanged. So I don't know if he had, wow. if there was just a case of wow. extreme, uh, you know, similarities, right? And so wow. I did some alchemy, you know, with the, the crucible, the mercury, stabilizing the mercury and filling with gold and producing the elixirs. And uh, and then that's only the beginning, because what you really use these things for is to create some sort of teleportation of your being into this other dimension, blah, 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 blah. I didn't, I didn't wow. manage teleportation, uh, but I did manage something else. Anyway. Uh, what, what's the something what else? else? <laughs> what's the something else? I want to hear all the stories. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. A lot of them. There's a lot of them. And uh, well, we got time. <laughs> what else? Um, well, of course. I mean, you know, one of the early things when I started, when I was very young, I I got hooked. Like you know, most young men on this thing of these sexual practices because I was obsessed with that. And so the promise that by doing these sexual practices, you will be forever young and become an immortal. And so I ventured to Taiwan at the time, <clears throat> then also in India and in Nepal, but sort of the first point for me was this place in Taiwan where I learned these uh, secrets of these practices where in theory, you know, if you do it, uh, you know, uh, you can have a lot of sex, and for six years, I didn't have one ejaculation. Six years, right? Wow. And you keep transforming your energy, transforming, and you have this state of kind of uh, 
luminosity and, and sort of internal bliss and whatever is it, and supposedly you never should get old again. And uh, so it's like, you know, all of these things, like I really put myself there and I say, I want to find out how real they are and how far I can go with it. Yeah. Um, but to come back to your original question, okay, what in youth I thought it was the greatest and coolest thing, for example, s- such things like I told you. Gradually, yep. I, I started to, they started to become less interesting. Why? Mm. <laughs> because uh, they didn't really change me. Mm. I was always me. So nothing right. really changed. It was always David. So there right. was not a true real transformation, even if the practices were very serious and you had to dedicate a lot of hours, a lot of effort uh, your mind become very, you know, kind of sharp and focused. And, you know, for sure your character is it's shaped in this process of practicing so intensely. Great. But, but there was not this original sense of divinity, of, of the holiness that I experienced when I was a child in, in church, right? Right. And, Interesting. And so I said... Okay, this is all great, but I'm looking for something else. I'm looking for for real holy beings, holy people, right? Yeah. And and the journey then took me to India to meet uh, uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Oh wow! Who who is the person who truly and firstly and mostly changed my life? Wow. And you know, she didn't fly, she didn't levitate, she didn't materialize things, uh, but. What I saw and what I experienced there uh, touched me and changed me in a way that none of these shamans, gurus, Taoists uh, ever did. Mm. And um, he reconnected me also with my Christian roots, you know, um, yeah. although I was, never, I was never really sort of the kind of Christian that, you know, adheres to kind of church dogmas or the, or, or whatever is it right but the, right. the core the core of christianity you know when when john asked jesus uh, say rabbi teacher what is god jesus answered very simply god is love who is right. in the presence of love is in the presence of god that's it that's for me is christianity i do not accept the old testament as part of christianity or the church so for me christianity is just that sentence that's it can i i, I feel like i would like to take like a really quick moment before you talk more about mother Teresa, because sure. it's sure. such a beautiful sure. Teresa. i mean of such a beautiful synchronicity that uh so this morning a formal guest uh, a former guest uh, posted this meme that's kind of funny and um, and it was a person holding the Bible and it says God loves you so much that he created hell just in case you don't love him back and it's like you know a funny <laughs> meme and so so I I of course love this being raised very conservative Christian and my you know but I it, it led me to making this post and I'm going to just read it I mean I, I made it a, an hour ago so or two mm-hmm. hours ago which is uh, it's incredible how you just validated I said this meme is funny but it it is also sad that many people like my own father still believe this. I have no judgment for those individuals that do believe in a God that has a penchant for torture. Uh, Mm -hmm. I actually have unconditional love for them and take comfort in knowing that in some other now, whether in this life or another, they'll inevitably come to realize that the only hell that exists is one we create and that we can escape hell at any moment by tuning into unconditional love because unconditional love is actually synonymous with the energy referred to as God. And when you tune into to unconditional love, you're in the presence of God instantly. You are it, and it is you. And and there's more, but that that's pretty much what I just wrote. So hearing you say that is a beautiful confirmation. Perfect, perfect. It's really, it's really, it's really that. You know, it's interesting. I ended up uh, taking a deep, deep dive into into very serious Christianity. I went to live with the hermits in Ethiopia, where there are still. Uh, the cave desert eremites of, of the real root of, of the mystical Christianity. And then I went to Mount Athos uh, um, in Greece, is this holy mountain where people enter on and retreat and so forth and so on. And, and in, in the mountains of Romania, in Russia, in my own country, in Italy, to go and see some of these uh, uh, clusters of mystics that live the real sort of Franciscan ideal of Christianity of just prayer right and so i did met uh, i did meet some some true saints and uh, i consider christianity a 
again if cleaned, cleansed of all the structures that were logically that came to be associated with it, uh, it is truly phenomenal in many in many respects. And uh, but anyway, um, kind Mother of Teresa, to yeah, yeah, I kind of cut Teresa, you off from Mother yeah, Teresa, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You know, she she's she she changed my life without doing any miracle, and that for me was the big things. You know, she showed me the power of love. Love is action. And when you see the power of love in action, you see the greatest power that there is. Um, you know, I know that she has been criticized, uh, you know, because, I don't know, the donations, money, the fact that she didn't allow people to be vaccinated. And, you know, the, 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 we are human and we all are under a certain belief system. Um, right. But what she was doing, and I was there with her, and the present that she had, she was very old. They arrived at the very last years of her life. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what I've seen happening in these in this in the within these walls, uh, for me was probably the greatest miracle that I've seen. And you know, and by the time that I got there, I've seen a lot of miracles, right? Right. Um, and it's, it is most is what for the first time truly brought me out of myself. I understood that the spiritual part that I was doing was a very narcissistic, self centered. It's all about my energy, my spirituality, uh, mm. my chakras, uh, uh, my whatever is it, uh, my, 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 me, 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 I, 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 right? And so there is only yeah, space I... for me, my yoga, my practice, uh, and uh, my peace of mind. And for the first time there, I was able to let that all behind and to come out. And in the moment that you come out of yourself, suddenly the whole world is there. Mm. And and so that's really for me was the real beginning of a spiritual practice. It started really wow. there, and there. And in time, it is also what then brought me close, of course, to explore Christianity more in depth. But then eventually, is also what led me to Buddhism. So which which had, it was the end of my journey. It's interesting because in all my life, I had such an incredible aversion to Buddhism without no reason, just no reason. Mm. And yet, all the most meaningful and important masters that I met were Buddhist, and so and I resisted them. Right? Interesting. And it was literally at the end of a journey, and I tell you, um, we speak of uh, maybe six years ago that I actually kind of realized and accepted that I'm a crypto Buddhist, or I was a crypto Buddhist to a certain extent, right? And and when I arrived at, in uh, um, in Bodhgaya, the place where the Buddha became enlightened, uh, which is a place that I've always avoided on purpose, mm. and when I, for the first time, but six years ago, I arrived there, it's like I arrived home. It's like it was the end of a journey, and I could not arrive there before because I was not ready. Right. Interesting. And, and so this whole thing, and it, it doesn't mean that, that Buddhism is the best, okay, or anything like that. It just simply is my own personal kind of sure. the resolution of my own personal journey, my own personal, let's call it karma or, or identity. It's yep. there that I found the end of my journey. That's it. I arrived. And there was no more seeking, no more searching, uh, no more seeker. That's it. The answers were found. And and then I really entered very deeply since then into into Buddhism again, not the church Buddhism. I also know that in the States there is a lot of lamas, a lot of Dalai Lama, which is all great, but it's it's a lot of just another church with a lot of rituals and pajamas and yep. funny dresses and you know, and so <laughs> right. no, that's that's that that's not that's not sort of the Buddhism that they talk about, right? Right, right, right. Um, and, and of course, I mean, you know, after the, the experience of love, when love touches you, you are forever changed. When you allow love to touch you and, 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 and you receive it as a sacrament, and it's difficult to, everybody knows it, because actually we all know it. We yep. all know when love touches that it changes us. And then we yeah. always long for that. That soul is when we are truly at our best, and that's what we really long all the rest of our life, through all the rest of our experiences, both mundane and super mundane. Right. Um, and and then sort of so searching for miracles changed. So we go back to your original question: or what are the most amazing things you have seen? Well, again, in youth uh, was very physical things, 
And then eventually started to change. I started to become attracted. What I found really amazing and miraculous started to be other kind of things, right? Logically. Mm. Yeah, that that's such a beautiful um, perspective that you you are able to share because it truly it's like oh I don't need to go all the way around the world because David did it you know someone can think that to themselves okay you know all these things and I, I think you're right as I'm even looking at my own you know son who is um, you know just kind of uh, just start growing up just to, you know mm-hmm. just becoming a young man and now he's mm-hmm. all of a sudden getting fascinated you know uh, I just dropped him off at the airport he's reading autobiography of a yogi on the plane and he's wow. like whoa dad right. I, I'm, I'm like I I just read I've already read the first part and he materialized this amulet thing at one point and you know what I mean and so he's that very young young man who's like so fascinated and so but you know the end of all the searching comes back to the same thing right and it is yeah. uh, love and and I think that is such a powerful powerful story yeah. yeah yeah love is the end of the journey and at the same time is the true beginning of the journey yeah Right, right. The end is the beginning and the beginning is the end, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and, and that makes me think of one other thing that I read uh, when, you know, looking at, at um, uh, an article that was written about you and an MIT uh, anthropologist who was, you know, talking about how you've you've studied more traditions, you know, than anyone as far as he knows. Uh, and then one of the things I came across was Somewhere where you were basically saying when we can see the form and the emptiness and the emptiness and the form, that's sort of Mm -hmm. the ultimate. And, um, you know, it, it, just saying that it kind of made, made, reminded me, you know, that the, the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning. The, the, <clears throat> what is the relationship that you found between form and emptiness? Um, I think that this question was asked uh, um, in the context of synesthesia, in the context mm. of uh, can we power up our senses so that we can start to experience the broader, wider, richer world by doing certain practices? And my answer was yes, of course, you know, we are attracted, all is more is better more senses, more stimulation, more colors, uh, all mixed together, right? And, uh, and, and at a certain point, my reflection was that in my experience, again, I, I went through that phase where, you know, when you start to, you put attention and you can start to open your, uh, I don't know, let's call it your internal vision, your third eye, and suddenly you can start to see people through like X-ray and you see auras and you see the energy of everything and everything is interconnected like in a big uh, LSD or ayahuasca trip. Uh, Right. And uh, uh, you see spirits and beings and angels and like, wow, and more and more and more. And then again, after a certain point, uh, you start to realize that uh, there is something else that is greater. And that is the space that exists in between and beyond everything that is seen, everything that appears. So all yeah. the realm of form in nature is empty. Okay. Right. So it's like looking at uh, at whatever you have in front of you, your computer, your 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 own body, or I don't know the wall that is in front of you, and and looking at it and you say, "Wow, it's such a beautiful form," and yet you know that from the standpoint of your physics, that form is actually largely made of empty space. But yep. we can't see this empty space. We are so cooked with our senses with what appear. And so right. the great gift that I had from Dharma, from, 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 from the teaching of the Buddha, from the practice that I did, the retreats that I did, is that suddenly you start to have this, I don't know, subatomic quantum vision. And, and so you lose the fascination with, with the forms that appear, the forms of experiences, the form of amazing sensation, the forms of, you know, whatever is it. And you start to really see that all that appear actually is created by this great emptiness. And this great emptiness uh, is not void. This emptiness is pregnant of something. Mm. Okay? And, 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 and that's really when things start to become interesting. So I think yeah. that that's probably where, where the question sort of started, in which context. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, ma- it makes me think, uh, you know, having read many years ago, um, 
uh, reading some work uh, by, you know, in teachings of Osho. And Osho was talking about this idea that, you know, that God emerges from the void, uh, this pregnant emptiness, as you put it. And so I'm curious mm. what your thoughts are on that concept. Um, well, on the concept of uh, God or, or concept oh, of on the concept of God, on, on the concept of like beyond God, which we kind of sort of think of God as love, as all things, right? It's all one, that sort of uh, prevalent idea. But beyond that, there's a void, an emptiness from which it it emerges. Sort of this idea that God comes from this this indescribable nothingness, even. And to me, it was kind of a, a shocking you know, thing to read. And that's what I think of when you, when, when we were just talking about this. So I just curious what your thoughts are on that concept, that idea. Um, well, uh, this again, it's a, um, it's a strong concept in, in Dharma and Buddhism. They speak of Nama Rupa, which are two Sanskrit words, which mean name and form. So the arising of one, it's, it's kind of deep, codependent or simultaneously arise with the other. So in the moment that there is a name, that something is named, that name is the form, okay? So it's a form, mm. however, virtual, unseen, but is the form, is the meme uh, of mm. a given something. So the world God, the experience of God, mm, it's still a name. That name corresponds to a certain form, which is the form that we as individuals hold in our mind of the divine. So every time that we name it, we are still attached to a given name that is a given form. And so the, the teaching of Buddha was, you know, uh, specifically it was the teaching of the Prajna Paramita, the perfection of wisdom, uh, to say that beyond the Nam and Rupa, beyond the name and form, there exists a an experience when form is perceived as emptiness, sort of when you see that the relative em the emptiness of the form, that the form is only sustained because of a name that is given to it. If you take out mm. the name, if you take out who pronounced that name, who knows God? I am. Mm. Who look for God? I am. Who experiences God? I am. So if you start to take out both the name that is called God, and if you take out uh, the very I, who is seeking, who is experiencing, who is looking, what is left? Mm. That is the experience that the Buddha spoke. So it's experience right. where you go beyond the very name and form that you are. Because Brandon David is a name, and this name is a form, is the form of our identity. So as right. long as we are identified with this name and this identity, with this sense of I am, okay, everything that we perceive mirror it and will be another name and another form. Hence, it cannot be it. Hmm. Interesting. Follow me here. Okay. I, yeah. It, it took me. A, it took me a while to get around that as well, but uh, <laughs> eventually I got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Well. Well done explaining the unexplainable. <laughs> so, so one of the things you know um, that I've I've been hearing a, a bit of, and I'm, I'm curious where you think, as someone who is so experienced like sort of witnessing not only these these um you know superhuman kind of phenomenon that actually exist we it, i'm sure you'd agree there's sort of a, a spiritual awakening happening on the planet this is you know becoming more pervasive and more you know um in vogue, if you will, people are paying attention more. It's becoming something a lot of attention and energy is going towards these days more and more. Where, you know, where do you think this is going for us? Is this, are we in the, in the process of evolving? Is this something that's going to become normal? I, I take an example of a listener um, that, you know, this time about a year ago, she had, uh, after lots of meditation, 
had a moment of anger, uh, like very intense anger. And then she had w- what she's pretty confident at this point is a Kundalini awakening. And she's like, it's never turned off since this energy that's this, you know, she is, you know, she refers to Kundalini as a she it's active in me all the time. Her skin has shed completely multiple times. Like, you know, and she's still trying to make sense of it all. What, what do I do with this? I don't even know what to do with sometimes it's you know it's 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 troublesome or difficult or you know and so I'm, I'm curious in all your studies where are we headed is this going to be you know i guess it's kind of two questions what are your thoughts on the you know kundalini awakenings and is this symbolic of something that you know is is kind of as we evolve collectively are we going to see more of this kind of thing are we going to see more superhuman abilities do you think <laughs> Um, well, yes, to a certain extent, I would say that uh, there is a, a resurgence of uh, the old genre from superheroes to Harry Potter, Doctor Strange, yeah. um, and of course, like, you know, yoga, it's in every corner. So right. people are, tai- if it's not yoga, it's Tai Chi, it's Qigong, it's uh, the whatever, some Lama. So for sure, or some shaman. Uh, so for sure, definitely, it seems that the the probably power of the internet, uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's making, it's creating a big comeback. So suddenly these things are now more available for everyone. Uh, um, and, and, and so they're becoming also... In the moment that they are so available and they so recognizable, people believe subconsciously start to believe that they might be more real or more possible. Right. And in the moment that, that you start to believe that is even remotely possible, that's it. You have created a possibility for it right. to happen. And uh, so I do believe that uh, that more and more people that are exposed to these things and are practicing them, experimenting with themselves, uh, uh, eventually we will, uh, you know, do something right and some good things will start to happen. I don't know how far are we. I mean, uh, when I look around, uh, honestly speaking, very often I I cringe, like, you know, people that do so-called spirituality most of the time are very broken people, uh, um, kind of enacting a narcissistic uh, fantasy right. Spir- spirit, um, spiritual narcissism is a stop off on uh, the on the on the train ride i would say <laughs> exactly you know and then you know it was all the way back already when it was in the 70s i think uh, you know trumpa uh, that wrote this fantastic book uh, Trogi and trumpa it was called uh, i forgot the title but i think that this whole idea of the spirit narcissism started already back there so i mean that's the truth that when i look around i, I, I really is sometimes a little difficult to uh, people that change their name and go around calling themselves uh, Shanti something, I don't know, whatever. Mm, uh, right, thinking right. That, that, you know, that suddenly they are spiritual when, again, most of the time they're very not integrated people running away from something, not even aware they're running away from something and do not really have a, an actual solid um, neither practice nor experience, no direction, no clarity. So for sure we are still in uh, in the swamp but in the infancy but i'm in the infancy yes but i but i'm very positive that you know because that's the way the human mind works the human mind improves improves on the odds improves on mistakes improves generationally so i i do believe that eventually this whole thing is gonna lead somewhere very good right yeah i, I would agree with you um it, it it definitely seems to be uh you know, I think it's going to all lead to what you talked about, which is ultimately love, right? And, and you know, and I'd like to maybe just hear a little bit of your thoughts or ideas on this idea of, you know, something like Kundalini Awakening. I, I have to imagine you've experienced it, certainly studied it, run across it. It's It seems to be one of those things that is kind of a mixed bag for people that I, I mm-hmm. have uh, run across who, who've, who've had a very powerful experience. It, you know, it, what do you make of it? Do you think this is this dormant, you know, evolutionary force, the divine force in us that's that's sparking? Or is it, you know, what is your take? Um, well, uh, are you sure you wanted the answer to this? Uh, many people will not like it. 
Uh, I, I would. I, I want your answer. Yes. <laughs> Whether good or bad, hit me with it. All right. Okay. Um, in in the in the in the yogic process. Okay. So the 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 kundalini. It's uh, it's hardly something that can sort of randomly appear. Um, it's a very precise process where you have to be able to reverse the current of your inner energies. They're called pranenapana. Okay. And these two energy sort of they have to come together and collide. It's like a it's like a, a particle accelerator. Okay. And this is years and years of hard yogi training. I mean we speak of six, eight hours a day of non-stop practices. Uh, and it takes about 12 years of this continuous non-stop training uh, to knot together these two energies. When, when they collide and the knot is created, uh, the, it's called, they call it chandi, sort of this, the, this fiery, uh, literally chandi in Sanskrit means uh, um, fierce, wrathful, but also fiery. So to, this power wakes up inside and it is this power, this flame uh, that they say that you you the, the metaphor that they use is that uh, like how do you raise a snake from its uh, um, from its rest you know you 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 put a, a burning stick into it so the metaphor that is given is that you need to have light up the chandi and then the chandi is what actually wakes up and moves the kundalini I mean I can tell you that I've met in my life in my journey a handful of yogis, not just of people, of yogis that actually wake up Kundalini. So I leave, I leave it at that. I prefer so, not to make any further comment. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So, so it, it, it seems that you would be suspect that it would happen uh, aside from under very intense training. I am confident that whatever people, because logically I also teach these things, uh, is also part of my life. And of course, I had a lot of people coming, say, oh, I had a Kundalini awakening. And so I am confident and I can tell you that whatever people call a Kundalini awakening is not Kundalini. They are having some kind of, of release of latent energies that sort of runs up their body. And uh, because after the book of Gopi Krishna, everybody that experienced something similar think that they're having a Kundalini experience. So it's just a misnomer. So they, mm. they use a name and they associate that experience with that name. So I don't deny the experiences they are having. Uh, I believe that most people are genuine. Um, and they can, you know, as you say, you know, they can even come with certain physiological reactions. I just simply, I'm fairly confident uh, not to say just about sure that that is not Kundalini. It is something else, very powerful. I don't discuss it. There is even a name for it, but it just is not Kundalini. You said there is a name for it? Yes, I mean, that's most, most, most of what people experience. Again, if you want to use this term, it would be sort of some movement of what they call Udana Prana. Uh, it's uh, the specific uh, energies that, that tend to rise up. They're like hot flashes that, that rise up and bring about some kind of ecstasy or some kind of certain experiences and so forth and so on. But if we speak of Kundalini, I mean, someone that has moved this Kundalini is an accomplished yogi. That means he can stop his heartbeat at will. He can control his body temperature. He most probably can levitate, can manifest things, uh, and for sure can produce this very intense electric-like current. And I kid you not, it's like sticking your finger in a, twa in a, in a plug. So there, wow. are very there are very precise things. I told you, I, I became an expert in results. I look at all this tradition and I, I became an expert at what are the actual results that all these different traditions, spiritual practices lead to. So I, I made a very thorough analysis of what are the results. So that's why, again, I, I really just met a very small handful of yogis that actually have raised Kundalini. It's considered a great mm. achievement, even among yogis, people that live you know, naked, you know, the sadhus in India, all right. Mm -hmm. Even among even among the sadhus, is considered the great achievement. 
So mm. for the average person sitting at home uh, uh, and just because they had some kind of emotional breakdown and generally after an emotional breakdown, they suddenly had some, some Kundalini rising. Again, they have something, not just simply not, not, not Kundalini, just simply yeah. something else. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah, in this person's uh, so I'm case, sorry. they've had I'm it. Sorry if, yeah, I'm sorry. No, for this no, one, no, 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 no. That's, right. why, that's why I'm asking. I'm, I'm curious, you, you know, and, and this person doesn't claim to be an expert either. You know what I mean? They're just trying to make heads or tails of, for a year, this energy has been intensely coursing through their system, uh, a total <clears throat> change in their body type to some degree. Their skin has shed f- multiple <clears throat> times, you know, <clears throat> like, so they're just trying to make heads or tails, you know, it, what it could be. And, you know, based off sure. of information out there, it seems like the closest correlation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, I'll, again, I'll, uh, if, if they are in the, in the, in your podcast or their friend, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to connect if I can offer some, some, some mm. feedback or some else. Okay. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm happy. Excellent. Excellent. I'm, I'm, that, I may, they may want to do that. So I, that's really gracious of you to offer. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes as we kind of wind down here. Um, you've got uh, so all these years of study and and fascinating study. Uh, you're is is going to be condensed into a new show, correct? Well, yes. The, the, I had a few interesting offers and proposals. Uh, um, one good friend and student. Uh, uh, the guy who created the secret, you know, the law of attraction is Drew Harriot. Right? Uh-huh. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a few years ago, he say, you know, long story short and fundamentally, let's make a movie that capture, you know, part of your journey and that can be an inspiration for people. And that one was the beginning of, of, of a long process of me getting into this whole idea of, of, of making my life public. I've always been completely anonymous, uh, no marketing, barely no website, uh, no announcement. Uh, it was very hard to find me. Right. And so suddenly, uh, you know, I, I had my first smartphone about four years ago, right? <laughs> uh, Facebook, the same, right? So Instagram, I just started it this year. Can you imagine? So wow. from, from being this completely under the radar person to suddenly the idea of being projected uh, out there was for right. sure a big change that I'm still getting used to. And right. so there is now this documentary project that then uh, changed the van and now is in the hands of the Coppola family, you know, Francis for Coppola and Coppola the, uh, as right. producers. Right, yeah, yeah, right. And, uh, and then, you know, we're now discussing who could be distribution. It might be, could be National Geographic, could be uh, Discovery Channel, um, could be Netflix, uh, could yeah. be Gaia. You know, so for now we are like... Uh, Everything is possible. Everything is open, right, at, at the moment. Right. And then, the, you know, I had several other proposals to make, uh, not just a documentary, but also to make a, a proper scripted movie from, uh, you know, Village Roadshow, this big movie studios, one of their he, partners. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah their, I think so. Uh, you know, they did, for example, Mad Max. Uh, I don't know. I don't right. Know, they, they do really big movies, right? And say, so, you know, the story is amazing. Right. If, if you give me a proper script... Uh, we can actually make a real movie out of it. And then wow. we have proposals to possibly make like a episode, uh, like, you know, a seven or 10 uh, a pilot episode, uh, sort of an Anthony Bourdain, you know, going mm. on me, live TV, going around and, and looking for these people. So I had a number of proposals and uh, I honestly speaking, I've uh, at the moment, I sort of declined them all because uh, <sighs> I, I value my peace uh, uh, the most. Mm. <laughs> so right. I would probably will go through with something that allow me to anyway retain my space and, and you know don't necessarily be constantly in front of the camera because it's very demanding. And, and I think right. that it would sacrifice uh, uh, part of what I do, in a sense. Ah, I see, I see. Makes total sense, though. I, I, I totally get you. Well, I, I look forward to seeing, and I know the listeners do, whatever sort of body of work uh, may come out, you know, uh, out there in whatever form at some point. It sounds like it, it, that may happen. And if so. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure. It definitely will in a fairly short time. So uh, Excellent. St- stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to, to that. And um, now, 
as far as you know what you're doing these days you have <laughs> um you have a program uh, a program offering or, or training of some sort that you offer people Sure. Actually, also this one is uh, very new um, because before people really had to come and find me in order to learn from me. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I got convinced my, by some very good friends to say, you know, you have to sort of adapt to the times a little bit. Uh, and there is something nowadays that is called online teaching. And I was like, <laughs> uh, mm. so believe it or not, uh, we actually <laughs> just just uh, uh, finished to uh, just shot the the first online program which is available and uh, so you know you can you can start there excellent excellent and so and you and, and then, i talked I, mean, both- I, will, I will i will be in the states also i come to the states um not not very often but i do come to the states my very good friend student and partner is in california and i do work in new york also with tibet house um so i also will be in the states so there also there will be live teachings but for the moment mm. uh, uh this online program could be a good place to start yeah excellent and and before we <laughs> I love that before we talked, I mean, David, you're, you're truly the genuine real deal. Cause I, I brought up to you as like, Hey, do you have a program that you want to offer? You know, sometimes people will offer a discount, you know, to, to uh, positive head listeners, hint, hint, you know, and you're like, uh, I think maybe let's see. And we got your, we got your, um, you know, producer. tech guy on the phone, on the, <laughs> yeah, producer on the phone. And he said, yeah, 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 sure. We'll do that. And so, uh, for any of you listeners out there that want to, to get involved with David's brand new program, um, you go to positivehead.com forward slash David, and that will take you, uh, if you use coupon code, there's a, uh, there's going to be some free stuff for you, uh, essentially is what, what you guys were saying, which is very, very gracious, by the way, David, um, for the listeners. And then if they end up wanting to go kind of further down the rabbit hole with you, then um, they can use coupon code positive head, uh, all one word. And that's, uh, I think, you said a 20% discount or something. So very, very gracious uh, of you to do that. Very welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, guys, positivehead.com forward slash David will take you there. And then your coupon code, uh, if you go beyond the, f- the free content is uh, positive head, all one word. So, um, well, this has been absolutely amazing, David. I feel like I could literally hold you hostage for hours and like <laughs> force you to give me more of these magical stories. But uh, <laughs> I, I am that I still have that childlike wonder for sure. And uh, but I absolutely love the the message that all your seeking came back to it it really is it's the shortcut to everything you know like we said at the top of the show love is the answer now what was the question it truly exactly. is right yes right? exactly very very true and i do look forward actually to meet you in person brandon so i hope oh, likewise. Uh, some, somewhere in the world <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to happen. I, our, 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 our paths are, are aligned on, on some level. I mean, the fact that you're, you're, you've done what I, uh, you know, aspire to do, uh, is, uh, definitely says something. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to meeting in 3d as well. One day I do have one last cl- question I'd like to leave you with. Sure, and, sure. uh, that, that question is this, uh, in 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life according to David Verdesi? Love, kindness, compassion. Mm. Hey, just like the elevator, we got plenty of floors, plenty of seconds to go, but <laughs> you say it so well, David. Thank you so much for doing all that you do and, and thank welcome. you for being. Very welcome. Take Such an honor. And, uh, talk to you soon. Take care, Brandon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. Well, everyone, that concludes this week's interview episode. Before we sign off, I wanted to let you all know that we have finally created the Game with the Universe on our website where you can choose the first number that comes to your mind and it'll pull up that episode number of the podcast. I've been saying this is a great way to co-create synchronicity and magic with your higher self for quite some time by doing this manually. But now if you go to positivehead.com, forward slash Y O universe. There is a super fun and simple interface to play this game with your higher self. 
I firmly believe just by setting the intention to play in this way, it opens up the door for magic and it's a synchronistic way to hone in on nuggets of wisdom out of the huge catalog of episodes that are specifically appropriate for you at this time in your journey to becoming the next greatest and greatest version of yourself. And it also makes for a super fun way to engage and invite friends, family, people on social media to check out the podcast as well. So be sure to check out positivehead.com forward slash Y-O-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E and be sure to tell all your friends so they can play a game with the universe, which also helps the show to reach new people, which I greatly appreciate. And as a quick reminder, be sure to also check out positivehead.com forward slash transformation if you're curious to learn more about Purium Superfoods and why I take them every day. On this journey of becoming the next greatest and greatest version of ourselves that we have all embarked upon, I can't stress the importance of managing your physical vibration enough. And quite honestly, Purium has put together the simplest plan I've found to do so, and I'm sincerely excited to share it with all of you. Otherwise, as you continue on your fabulous journey in this 3D reality, be sure to remember this. As long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Journey well, everyone, and thank you for being.